Great. Uh, so let me share my screen. Thank you, James, for that really kind introduction. I'm very excited to be here today. My Texas roots go back a little bit further where my name actually comes from the fact that my parents met uh, while they were both students at UT Austin. So, uh, but that's UT Austin and Texas a and is better. So uh, with that, I'll start today's talk, which is going to be on uh, a general idea that I work on a lot called high order network data analysis. Uh, and and I'll, I'll define what that means. So as James is mentioning, I tend to study large scale complex networks and we can think about these uh, complex systems as, as graphs uh, in a mathematical or computer science sense. And this shows up all over the place. So things like communication networks, say email nodes are, are nodes in a graph might represent people or, or email accounts edges would show information exchange. Uh, something we're all worried about right now is physical proximity networks, uh, which are networks where the nodes are or graphs where the nodes are people and edges link people that are in close proximity. So everybody's thinking about this for COVID. Uh, online commerce or commerce in general, uh, nodes might be products and edges link products that are that are purchased together. Oh, yes. okay. uh, and drug compounds where nodes are say substances and edges connect substances that appear in the same drugs. And so this graph formalism or network formalism, I'll use those words interchangeably, uh, has been used to gain insight into a lot of different types of, of systems. And these are just kind of the types of questions we might ask. Um, so how things evolve or change over time. This is you know, how people design recommender systems or how Google fills in say uh, automatic suggestions for who to email. Uh, there's clustering, uh, partitioning your community detection problems where the goal is to say, find uh, groups of related nodes, say groups of products. This also gets used in, in recommender systems. Spreading or traversing, we might think about how, thing, how, the, how things move over a network. So, so think about viruses or misinformation or ranking, uh, which is just saying which things are important in the graph. Uh, and this is kind of the idea underlying page rank or search. But one of my shticks is that uh, real world systems are not just composed of these pairwise interactions that connect uh, two things together. They're really composed of higher order interactions that compose multiple things at a time. And so here's the same type of networks, communication networks. Well, we send email, but we are often sending email to multiple people at the, at the same time. And so it's really a group conversation, not a pairwise one. Physical proximity networks, it's really groups of people that are gathering together at a time. It's not just two people at a time. In commerce, uh, products are often co-purchased together. Even this recommend, recommender system from Amazon actually recommends three things for me to purchase together uh, at one time. And drugs are made up of multiple substances at, at, and not just two. So what I'm gonna do today is try and go from this formalism of graphs or pairwise connections to other formalisms that uh, take into account these, what I call higher order interactions. So multiple entities that interact at the same time. And I'll draw a bunch of pictures like this where these circles you can think of as connecting say multiple nodes at a time. And so we can really ask the same types of questions that we were asking before. We can ask kind of how things will evolve. Uh, we can still ask what are kind of important groups of nodes or other important groups. We could, we could ask how things spread and we could also still ask what's important. And so in today's talk, I'm going to go over kind of three methodologies that I've been working on over the past couple of years that get at some of these questions. They're largely contained within these three papers and they span kind of stuff that's more applied as well as stuff that's a little more theoretical. So hopefully there's something here for everybody. Um, and so I'm gonna spend the first part of the talk uh, on temporal evolution of, of higher order interactions. Um, and this is going to be joint work with uh, Reddy Epebebe, who's now at UC Berkeley, Michael Schaub, who's, who was at MIT and now has uh, just started a job in Europe, uh, John Kleinberg, my colleague here at Cornell, and Ali John Babai at MIT. So before we even start asking kind of the right mathematical models, I usually like to start by collecting a bunch of data and seeing what's, what's going on. 
And so when I started thinking about these questions, I really just wanted to collect a bunch of data from, from the wilds uh, as kind of a, a way of finding a good set of, of test cases. And all this data that we collected is publicly available online too. Um, so some of the data sets we looked at are co-authorship uh, data sets in various domains. So, so people write papers together, they write papers in groups, not just pairs. Uh, the email data, emails that I had discussed earlier, we collected some email data sets. We looked at tags on, on Stack Exchange forums like Math Overflow. So here in this question, there's, there's four tags applied to this question, linear algebra, graph theory, eigenvalues, and eigenvectors, and algebraic graph theory. And so these four tags are applied at once to this one post, and we can consider kind of a, a network of higher interactions of tags. Similarly, we could look at people that tend to participate on the same thread. These are these users here circled in blue. We also have some contact or proximity networks uh, that measure group interactions in, in, in physical space, musical collaborations, uh, substances that make up drugs, as I was discussing, um, Congress committees over time, and also combinations of drugs that, uh, that hospitals see in emergency room visits. And all of these data sets are time stamped, which is important because I wanted to study the temporal evolution of these things. And I'm going to call each of these kind of higher interactions for this part of the talk a simplex. So, so a simplex we can just think about as some subset of nodes. Okay. And so as more of a cartoon, here's what the data looks like. We have a bunch of what I'll call simplices or small sets. They each describe a small set of nodes, say a group interaction. And there's two pictures I'd like you to, to have in mind. This one on the left is going to be kind of a, a, a picture where we have uh, all of the connections where the higher order interactions are filled in. So like nodes one, seven, and eight, they appear together in a group at time t5. So we fill that in. And the other thing is what we're going to call the projected graph, where this is just going to take all of the induced pairwise connections given by the higher order ones. But we're going to weight all of the edges in the graph by the number of higher order interactions. So there's a weight of two between nodes one and two here. And that's because they appear in a simplex at time t1, as well as at time t8. So you end up with immediately this funny kind of pattern um, that, that, that really pops out when you start looking at this data. And this is the difference between uh, what I call a filled in triangle or an open triangle. And so this is a small part of a co-authorship network. It includes my PhD advisor at the bottom, my colleague at the top, and my PhD advisor's PhD advisor on the far left. And I've weighted all the edges here by the number of papers we've co-authored together. Um, but you'll notice that on the left, I've filled in this triangle. And that's because there are, there's at least one paper that uh, was written by all three of these authors. While I've left this triangle over here open because John, Yuri, and I have not worked on any one project together, even though each of us as pairs have worked on a project together. And so you can already immediately see that if you just thought about this as a graph problem, you wouldn't be able to make this distinction. And so here's a warm up question I like to ask uh, related to this research. Um, so what do you actually think is more common in data that there are three, say, nodes where each of them pairwise interacts in some way, but not all three together? Or do you get more of these filled in triangles, these closed triangles? I'll pause there. And if anybody wants to take a stab at guessing, I'd, I'd be happy to hear uh, any guesses. All right, so there's, okay, there's guesses for both closed, closed and, and open. Um, so that's great. All right, wow, there's a lot of guesses. Okay, participation is excellent. Um, so as always, this is a trick, trick question. So in academia, the answer is always that it depends on the data. Uh, so in some data sets, we see nearly all of the triangles uh, uh, are closed. And actually, this is very co common in co-authorship data. But if you look at something like uh, the 
tags on various stack exchange forums, nearly all of the triangles are open. And so we don't have great explanations for why this is happening. Um, but I do think it's an interesting jumping off point. Um, okay. Wait, so in tags, you're saying that there, there are pairwise tags, but you don't have the triples occurring together. Yeah. So, so it seems really yeah. weird. Yeah. 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 So, so there's kind of two arguments. You might think that, well, if you have kind of large sets of, uh, that are appearing, they kind of induce a lot of triangles. So if I have a paper that has 20 authors, this, in, this induces a lot of closed triangles amongst, amongst authors, 20 choose three of them. Um, one thing that works against uh, tags is that there's a maximum of five tags that you can apply to a question on these forums, which is kind of a built-in rule uh, that they have. Um, and that, that, that's actually one of the driving factors that causes these open triangles. We do have some models for, for this, but, but I, uh, I won't get into it in today's talk. One thing we do see is that um, even within kind of a given data set domain, we do tend to see the same types of patterns. So, so we took, uh, say, data from co-authorship, tagging, co-participation on threads, email, uh, proximity networks, and we sampled ego nets, which are just take one node in that network and consider everybody it's connected to and all of the, the hired interactions that amongst those people. And then all I'm plotting here is the fraction of triangles that are open on the y-axis and the average degree on the x-axis in a log scale. And you can kind of see that these data sets from the same domain tend to be clustering together. Um, and so these partitions here are coming from just a simple logistic regression model that tries to predict the domain of a data set given by uh, just these two characteristics of an ego net. And this achieves, you know, say 75% accuracy as opposed to 21% accuracy with random guessing. So it doesn't get everything right, like some of these purple things here. Okay. So we have this data. There's some interesting uh, characteristics. Um, so one kind of formalized prediction problem we were interested in was can we actually predict which new groups will appear, which new simplices will form? And in particular, can these open triangles ever become closed triangles or how do they become closed triangles over time? And so we went about this by studying kind of the transitions that a group of three nodes makes uh, uh, as time evolves within one of these networks. And so here, if we were to take say nodes one, two, and six, at the beginning, there's no, no connections between them. Um, but then at time T1, you know, there's some edge that connects one and two. And then at time T3, there's some new edge that connects one and six. At time T4, there's a node that connects two and six. At this point, we have an open triangle. And it's not until time T8 that uh, uh, we get this triangle to be filled in. And so we were calling these things simplicial closure. The, the, so you take a simplex and it, all of a sudden it closes at some point in time. And we did do stuff with things higher than, than, than groups of size three, but I'll just focus on groups of size three for today's talk. And so these trajectories uh, end up being pretty revealing. Um, so here's one example from our paper where, where we looked at the kind of combinations of things that were going into uh, pharmaceutical drugs that the FDA approves. And here the nodes are kind of descriptors of what, of what uh, is going into the drug. So here there's HIV protease inhibitors, UGT1A1 inhibitors, and breast cancer resistance protein inhibitors. And then there was this drug Rayataz in 2003 that used both HIV protease inhibitors and UGT1A1 inhibitors. And then as things go along, kind of maybe another drug uses that same combination, then some other drug uses this other combination, and then their uh, fourth drug uses this combination that fills in this edge at the bottom and so forth. Um, and actually what was happening here is that uh, we finally got this simplicial closure event at the end with this drug Evotaz, uh, which finally used all of these things at once. And if you look at what Evotaz is, it's actually a, a hybrid drug. Uh, 
um, developed as an HIV antiretroviral. And so uh, the way in which these simplices were closing, one, one way in which these simplices were clo closing in this data set is, is that people are forming hybrid drugs from two different uh, drugs that were using uh, kind of different substances in them. And one thing that was very useful for our analysis was to bin the kind of edge weights of the number of times that two nodes have appeared in some simplex together into what we call weak or strong ties. So this is something you might uh, learn about in kind of a, a social networks class, but for, for mathematical purposes, we'll say that a weak tie is one where the edge weight is equal to one. So saying there's exactly one simplex that contains these two nodes. And a strong tie will be an edge weight of at least two. So at least two simplices uh, contain say two nodes i and j. And you can enco encode this and say a weighted graph w. And so the uh, prediction problem or, or the, uh, yeah, the prediction problem we were interested in was, well, if we just say, took the first 80% of the data in, in time and looked at configurations of triplets that were not closed. And then we looked at the final 20% in time. Could we see any patterns in what, uh, what tended to get closed? And we saw some pretty consistent similarity across all of the data sets I was talking about earlier. So uh, each point in this plot is a data set and uh, both axis, axes are a corresponding to a probability, which is just the probability that a given set of size three would close, given that its configuration in the first 80% of the data had the structure that's on the X or Y axis. So this is a, an open triangle here of all weak ties and a, a, a set of two edges, but not a third one of, of both weak ties. And here we see that since all of these are below the, the Y equals X axis, this structure at the bottom was much more likely to close in the final 20% of the data. So increased edge density amongst uh, triples is more likely to, is, a, is a bigger indicator of, of simplicial closure. We saw a similar thing where increasing the tie strength of an edge also increases the probability that one of these groups of three will form a, a, a closed triangle in the future. And lastly, we saw somewhat of a tension between whether or not tie strength matters or edge density matters. And this is the plot on the far right. You can see sometimes edge density is more important and sometimes just ties, having strong ties is more important. And so these, the observations on the left in the middle, um, these are actually consistent with, with classical social network theory. Um, although a lot of these aren't social networks, but they they do have this, this property. Um, but this idea on the right was something that, that hadn't really been um, thought about before. So we wanted to frame this more as a machine learning problem. And so to do this, we can say, we have all this data. We'll say that we observe simplices up to time t. And then we want to predict new groups of size at least, two, at least three or greater than two uh, that will appear together uh, in the future. And so in this little setup here, if our partition here at time t was after time t6, we would like to predict uh, that this group of nodes one, two, and six participate together in some, some hybrid interaction uh, after time t. And so I just want to point out that this is a type of structure that if you treat this as a graph problem, you wouldn't even really consider this type of prediction problem. Um, and so link prediction is a, is a classical task in network science um, used for things like friendship recommender systems on Facebook or Twitter uh, and so forth. But when we go to this higher order regime, we now have this kind of new prediction problem that is something where if I just treated my data as a graph, I wouldn't it would be hard to even come up with the problem itself. Okay, so when we wanted to design algorithms for making these predictions, we, from the data analysis that we had done earlier, we kind of had two important things in mind. One is that edge density tends to matter. And so we focused our prediction task on cases where we were just trying to determine between given an open triangle 
whether or not it would become closed. So open triangle in the first 80% of the data, does it become closed in the final 20% of the data? And we know that tie strength matters. So can, there's actually a lot of ways that we could try and incorporate this into an algorithm. And so we ended up coming up with kind of a bunch of heuristics. Um, so we developed say a score function for a given triplet of nodes. And the score function could be purely just a function of the kind of weights between the edges on those, on those three nodes. We also looked at kind of generalizations of Jacquard similarity for these, for, for sets of size three, um, if you're familiar with those types of link prediction algorithms and social network analysis. We also look at kind of whole network similarity scores like PageRank uh, and CATS uh, as a way of, of making predictions. And we also had kind of a, a, a more standard machine learning model, uh, just a simple one of logistic regression with using the features generated by the, the score functions one through three. And so all these score functions, they're just trying to, to, to decide which triangle is most likely to open and they're sorry, most likely to close. And we make our predictions based on whichever triangles have the, have the highest scores. Okay. So There's a quick uh, question about your setup uh, in the chat, which is basically, did you, you segment it by time, the, the 80% and the 20? Yeah, sorry, we segmented by time, correct. Yeah. Yeah, so there's another way of setting up these types of problems where if you don't have time and you're thinking about more about missing data, you could do something like randomly delete 20% of your data and, and try and predict that missing 20%. Um, but here, since we had the temporal data, um, we were doing it in, a, in that fashion. And then one more follow-up from the chat, is that considering all the triplets? So here we are only going to consider all of the triplets in which each pair has been in at least one interaction together. So we, we already know that kind of these open triangles are more likely to close than, than other structures. And so we're just going to start with that and just trying to determine whether or not a, an open triangle will become closed or not. Great questions. OK, so blah, blah, blah. Here's a really big table with a lot of results. That's boring. Let me parse it for you. Uh, the results are we can predict pretty well on all of the data sets with some simple method. Um, one of the simple methods I described. A lot of them are heuristics. Um, I don't know why, but predict predicting new group interactions on thread co-participation, co so multiple users participating on the same thread on, on Stack Overflow, or predicting new tags, uh, of, sorry, new groups of three tags that would be used together on some question on, on Stack Overflow. Those ones are tend to be really easy to predict. And the best predictor is just take the harmonic mean of these three edge weights. And actually overall, simple averaging of these edge weights tends to work extremely well. So there are lots of fancier methods you could use, but this kind of sort of very local heuristic tended to, to work very well. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, so yeah, uh, let me reiterate that point. So um, we tried a lot of generalizations of classical link prediction methods uh, for this problem uh, of high, well, higher order link prediction. And again, these super simple uh, heuristics, which are just let's do some sort of harmonic mean or arithmetic mean or generalized mean of these three edge weights. And whichever one has the highest score, that's what we will predict will form a closed triangle. So the kind of stronger tie strains that you have, that's what will tend to close. And this is kind of a, a distinction from the way people have evaluated link prediction methods in the past, which really try and use a lot of more global information about the network. Um, and I think the difference here is that 
if you're trying to make a prediction about some interaction on k nodes, and you want to look at subsets of size k minus one, this is really meaningful when k equals three. So if I'm trying to make a prediction about a group of size three, looking at subsets of size two tends to be super informative. But if I'm in the graph case and k is equal to two, and I'm trying to make a prediction about two nodes, there's not too much I can say just by looking at the two endpoints of the nodes. Like I could maybe argue that if they both have high degree, maybe they're local, likely to connect. But um, generally, you have to go a little bit beyond and do some sort of neighborhood methods uh, or, or, or longer paths in, in graph data. So this inspired some, some other research where the idea was to, uh, if this is all we need to make predictions in these, in these algorithms, often we don't need to, to do this for all of the triangles. We can just find, say, the, the top k. Um, and uh, we have some, just for the sake of time, I'll just briefly go over this. We have some algorithms that can, that can do this much faster than, than brute force. And, uh, and just as one example on this, say, Spotify data set, we were looking at uh, trying to find triangles that had this highest mean weight amongst three edges. It would take, say, even it would take like, let's say I wrote too long, but it would take days using even, even fast kind of triangle enumeration schemes. Whereas with this top K algorithm that we developed, it, it only took around 30 seconds. All right, so to wrap up this section there, I think I was struck by how common a lot of the data sets act, uh, uh, evolve over time. There's a lot of signal in subsets of, of higher order interactions. And we didn't do any fancy neural network stuff for this, but I would please invite people to uh, outperform our simple baselines here with those methods. Um, so before I move to the next part of the talk, I'll just pause for a second in case there are any uh, questions. So as people are thinking of a question, Austin, um, so I talked to my students a lot about, you know, sort of data driven or sort of question driven science, right? And so the questions that you ask, did you go into this knowing the right questions or is it more, you started with the data, you started with this sort of triangle idea and then the question came to you? Uh, that's a good question, yeah. So I feel like we sh in general should be problem driven. Our general problem, in this case, to be honest, our answer, the, like the, the real driving thing was there's a bunch of data that looks like this. One simple question seems to be if I have three nodes, I have an edge weight on all pairs, that edge weight could be zero. What does the function look like of the likelihood that, that we'll see a, a closed triangle as a function of those three edge weights? And that's really the question that started, that was the, the data exploratory data question that started a lot of this, this research. Um, yeah, so I tend to think about problems, or I also think about those meta research questions on how to approach research. Um, and I often find it useful just to have some basic question of like, here's several data sets. What's something we think should be true? And can we measure it? And then that often leads to new interesting questions. Um, to segue into the second part of the talk, uh, where I'm going to talk about clustering, this was driven by a very a diff different question, which was actually a theoretical question, which we then ended up applying to, to, to data problems. Um, <clears throat> and it was based on thinking about minimum ST cuts, which are a uh, kind of fundamental optimization problem and contains fundamental algorithms that every undergraduate learns about uh, in their undergraduate computer science algorithms course. And it's a simple question, which is just if I have a set of, I have a graph, I have two nodes, one called the source, one called the sink, S and T. I want to find a subset of the nodes, capital S, such that when I look at how many edges 
are cut by the, uh, or how many edges are going outside of the set S, I want to minimize that number and that's called minimizing the cut. And even though this looks like a difficult combinatorial problem, amazingly, we have polynomial time algorithms for this. And so kind of the classical literature on this is, you know, the max flow min, min cut um, duality. And this is used for all sorts of say routing problems in operations research. It's also used in a lot of data mining algorithms. So things like finding dense subgraphs, uh, semi-supervised learning on graphs and also local graph clustering. And so, uh, as I said, we're motivated by a theoretical question, which was what is kind of a higher order analog of these graph cuts? Um, and then after I discuss that, I'll say how we applied this to a local graph clustering algorithm. Okay, so as I was saying, as, or as I've been trying to repeat over and over, oftentimes we have these higher interactions that uh, go beyond graphs. One way of modeling this, I'm gonna, I called them simplices in the last part of the talk because that's how we describe them in the paper, but here I'll talk about them as, as hyper edges in a hypergraph. And so hypergraph is just a fancy generalization of a graph where you have, again, a set of nodes, but now your edges, your edge set is a, a set of subsets of the nodes. And um, so here there's one edge connecting one, two, and three, and one edge connecting two, four, and five. And as soon as you make this generalization, uh, it is, starts to become very unclear how to even define what a minimum cut means. And the problem is illustrated by this simple graph here, which is that I've drawn a partition. So the set S is over here. And there's two hyper edges that get cut. There's this one in blue where there's two nodes on one side and two on the other. And there's this one in green where there's one side on, on the source side and three on the sink side. And so you might immediately ask, should we somehow treat these differently? Uh, and surprisingly in theoretical computer science, the answer has been no, uh, we don't treat them differently. And more recently, in, uh, in at least the data mining and machine learning literature, people have been modeling them differently. If I had hyper edges of size 10, I might really want to consider one node on one side and nine on the other to like not be penalized that much. Um, whereas maybe a five five split might be, might be more looking like a cut. And so this is a problem again, that doesn't show up in graphs because there's only one way to cut an edge in a graph. You have to put one node on one side and one on the other. And actually it also doesn't really show up with hyper edges just of size three because there's only one way to split a triangle or one way to split a size three hyper edge. You put one node on one side and two on the other. So things get interesting when we get to size four hyper edges. Okay, so we have this model um, for hypergraph cuts that we developed, which I, I was surprised how little in the literature there is on this topic. Um, and the idea is that we're going to incur some penalty at every hyper edge, which uh, gets cut, that we're going to uh, encode by this thing we call a splitting function, and, and I'll define what that means. The splitting function takes as input the hyper edge it's representing and also the set S and it just computes the intersection. And this spits out some value. And now we're going to define a hypergraph minimum ST cut problem as just the sum over all edges where we evaluate the splitting function uh, subject to kind of the standard ST uh, constraints. And it's natural to consider some, some constraints on what the uh, the splitting function can look like. So non-negativity is one thing. Um, so we'll say that kind of the penalty can only be zero or positive. We'll also say that if the hyper edge is not cut, then it's not going to incur any penalty. And then the last constraint is one that turns out to be of mathematical convenience and also describe a, a large range of things that people have been using uh, hypergraph cuts for, which are we call cardinality-based splitting functions, which is to say that this splitting function is going to penalize things based on the, uh, if a hyper edge is split, the minimum number of nodes on either side of, of the split. 
And so let me illustrate that with, with this uh, example here, this, this blue hyperedge is split two, two. The minimum of two and two is two, so we incur some penalty f of two. This green one is split one and three. The minimum of one and three is one, so we incur some penalty f of one. It turns out these types of cardinality-based splitting functions appear in a number of places in the literature, not only in data mining and machine learning, but also uh, you know, for partitioners used in scientific computing uh, and also in kind of combinatorial optimization problems. And our cardinality-based splitting function modeling framework actually allows us to account for all of these types of things. And so definitions are all fine and good, but can we actually solve the induced optimization problem? And to do this, we use a technique that people have been using for a long time to solve hypergraph problems, which is to use graph reductions. And so the way these work is we define some gadget uh, or an expansion that models a hyperedge with a small graph. And then we take our hypergraph, we replace all the hyperedges with its gadget, we glue them all together, and we solve a min cut problem on the graph, which we know how to do. And then finally, we take the results on the graph and we convert it back to a solution on the hypergraph. And so these various types of gadgets that people have used in the past are actually modeling just specific types of cardinality-based splitting functions. So this clique expansion is modeling kind of a quadratic penalty. The star expansion or the bipartite expansion is modeling a linear penalty. And this very complicated looking thing, uh, the, the Lawler gadget is minimizing kind of an all or nothing penalty. And so we have some, some new gadgets. There's uh, a lot of details in proving things about this um, that I'll gloss over for now. The main theorem that, I, that came out of this result though, um, that I think is very interesting is that we have this new class of hypergraph min ST cup problems. If we use cardinality based splitting functions to penalize the cuts, then the problem is graph reducible and polynomial time solvable via these gadgets, if and only if the splitting function is submodular. Uh, and some submodular is just a, a property of certain set functions. Um, so this characterization, characterization I thought was quite striking, um, but it still raises a couple of questions, which is what happens when the splitting function isn't submodular? Can you somehow solve the optimization problem even if you can't do it just by reducing the problem to a graph problem? Um, like, are there other algorithms that we could think about? And that's largely where we got stuck, which was uh, all, the, all the problems we know how to solve are ones that we can just convert to graphs and solve on graphs. Uh, but what is interesting is we did identify some types of splitting functions that end up in min cut problems that are hard to solve, NP hard. And this is very different than like one of the hallmarks of min SD cuts on graphs is that you can actually solve them in polynomial time. So now we have some natural hypergraph problems where the, the problem becomes NP hard. There are some places, these blue lines where, where it becomes reducible to a graph problem. And then there are some places where we don't know the complexity. And so here's a very concrete uh, theoretical question that I'd be very happy if anybody had an answer to, which is, uh, if you just took a hypergraph where all the hyperedges have size four, and I give you a source node and a sync node, is there an efficient algorithm to find the minimum ST cuts that has no two, two splits? So you're only allowed to do one, three splits. This is an open question uh, that I think is very clear to define and not at all obvious what, what the answer is to me at least, but maybe it's obvious to, to some of you. All right, so that was a large theoretical divergence, but that, that is how we started thinking about this problem. Um, and once we had this framework, we have been trying to deploy it in various settings where minimum ST cut solvers uh, get used for data mining applications. And one of those applications is uh, local clustering in graphs. And so the idea in local clustering is that we don't uh, normally, we might think of clustering as taking all the data points and putting them into 
putting them into groups. In local clustering, we're going to think about just focusing our attention on one part of the graph. So we're going to input some reference or seed set. And we want to find some good cluster that is near that seed set. Um, and the way these algorithms work uh, typically for these problems is that they don't end up even looking at the entire graph. They kind of just start down, say, in the area they're interested in, and they expand out a little bit until they're confident enough that they have a good solution. Um, okay, so this might be like an application of this might be well, if you're if you have like some product on Amazon that you are trying to figure out what class it, what category it should belong to. Well, you could look at the co-purchase graph and then kind of search around um, and find what other nodes have, have what other categorical classifications. Okay, so these flow-based methods uh, minimize a, an objective function that is a localized notion of conductance. Uh, there's a, this, it's a ratio uh, term where the numerator has a cut term. And so this we want to make small. We don't want too many edges leaving the set. And the denominator has kind of two, what are called volume terms where the volume is the sum of degrees in a set. And so there's two terms, one that kind of rewards high overlap with the seed set that you put in. And one that penalizes uh, in inclusion of nodes that are, that are not in the seed set. Amazingly, there are a bunch of fast algorithms for, for this problem. And even more amazingly, they solve the problem exactly. So again, this is a combinatorial optimization problem that looks hard at first, but you can actually solve them uh, rather, uh, you can solve them in polynomial time. And the way that you do this, and I'll, I'll gloss over some of the details here, you end up constructing a bunch of minimum ST cut problems, and you solve a sequence of ST cut problems. Uh, and these have certain theoretical uh, guarantees. Okay. The important thing is you can design these fast algorithms only with minimum ST cut solvers. And so we wanted to generalize these local clustering type techniques to uh, the hypergraph setting. And to do this, we just introduce a, a, a hypergraph version of the conductance metric. We can design an algorithm that minimizes it exactly using our hypergraph min ST cuts framework. It has these local, strongly local guarantees, which just means that the running time only depends on the size of the seed set and not on the, uh, the size of the uh, hypergraph itself. And we also have some like other nice theoretical guarantees that also improve things in the case of graphs. Okay. So this objective that we developed says something very similar to the graph case, which is, well, instead of a graph cut, we have a hypergraph cut. And now we know how to define those based on the theory we did earlier. And then we also have these volume terms, which again, encourage overlap with, with the seed set. And here, the volume is just based on the sum of the number of hyper edges that nodes appear in. Okay, and the algorithms work by forming uh, an instance of a hypergraph ST cut problem. And we know how to solve that um, uh, given our prior work. And so a th one theorem out of this work is that we can repeatedly solve minimum hypergraph ST cut problems to exactly minimize this localized conductance uh, uh, metric exactly. Now, even just solving one ST cut problem is uh, usually you would think about having to set it up for the entire graph. And so you think you at least have to look at the entire graph once in order to do this. But it turns out you can build these more localized ST cut problems uh, that, that don't actually need you to look at the entire graph because you have guarantees on where you, you could possibly do better. And so we end up having to build these sequences of problems very carefully. And so we do these types of gadget reductions locally. We don't do it over the entire hypergraph at once. And if we do this, we get this notion of strong locality, which is that our algorithms can actually run in a time that's proportional to the size of the seed set, the set R, and not in the size of the hypergraph. 
So if we have a super large hypergraph, we don't actually even have to look at all of it. We can just look locally nearby um, and get an optimal answer. Okay. And again, this is the idea in this little video here, which is that we start with some seed set down here in the bottom. We're growing it by computing solutions of ST cut problems that are constrained in a way that we know the solution will stay localized. And we kind of grow out a little bit until we're confident uh, enough that we have the right answer. Um, and you can see that we're not actually exploring the entire network here. Okay. And kind of in addition to um, kind of solving this problem in terms of this hypergraph local conductance, you might think that's kind of a contrived metric. It turns out we cannot actually give guarantees in terms of other uh, uh, more standard notions of, of, of how good a, a cluster is, like normalized conductance, if you're, or sorry, normalized cut, if you're familiar with that type of stuff. Um, but yeah, there's some theory about that. We applied this to uh, a couple of data sets. One was a, a Stack Overflow data sets where the nodes correspond to questions on Stack Overflow. And there's a hyper edge connecting all the nodes that are answered by the same user. So there's about a million users, a million uh, hyper edges and 15 million questions or nodes. The average hyper edge size is pretty big. It's about 24 and the maximum actually goes up to 60,000. And we use tags uh, on the Stack Overflow questions as a proxy for a, a ground truth clustering. And what we do is kind of we seed clustering methods with uh, um, a, a few instances of questions with a particular tag. And then we search the hypergraph for other uh, questions that have the same tag. And we can evaluate here, um, we outperform other methods, but that's just an artifact of having to write papers in computer science. One of the important things I want to point out is that uh, you could try and reduce the problem to a graph problem first, and then solve the problem on a graph. And this turns out to give much worse solutions. This is what's in green um, compared to what's in blue, which is our algorithm, we called it hyperlocal. So, having the hypergraph information is actually important for finding the good clusters. Um, so how fast do these things run? Uh, here's another data set, uh, a hypergraph of Amazon products where, where nodes are products and all nodes, all products reviewed by the same person uh, form a hyper edge. Again, about millions of nodes, millions of hyper edges. The hyper edges are pretty big. They're on average about size 17. And here, product categories are providing with pro providing us with ground truth information on, on clusters. And again, we do the same experiment. We seed with a few clusters that we know the label for, and then we evaluate and how well it's able to re recover those clusters. And again, we see that the hypergraph version does better than, than kind of graph-based versions. Some of the times though are pretty remarkable. So depending on the size of the reference set or the seed set, these algorithms take only a few seconds to a few minutes to find the optimal solution to a combinatorial optimization problem without even needing to look at the entire network. And so I think that's uh, pretty cool. We have some more theory on making this faster in practice. Um, okay, so since I'm running low on time, um, I'll just say there's a few papers we have on this topic. Um, and so there was a third part of this talk, which clearly I'm running uh, low on time. So I'll, I'll take maybe a couple questions and then I'll just try and go over maybe a few of the interesting looking pictures from the third part of the talk. Um, so, Someone asked, does the F1 score depend on the seed choices or the graph reduction? So the F1 score could certainly depend on the choice of seed. Um, here I'm hiding this fact, but we're actually doing this for like 
10 different random samples of seeds, and this is the mean performance of those 10 samples. So I think those types of results are pretty robust. There are different types of graph reductions you could do. We were considering um, a particular one, and uh, it is true that you could, you could possibly consider other graph reductions. Um, but I will say the graph reductions people use are all special cases of, of the hypergraph framework we have. So in that sense, uh, you could just use our framework. And if you wanted to try out graph reductions, that's just kind of a special case of choosing a particular type of splitting function. Okay. Great. All right. I'll pause there for, for one minute and I uh, will just go over one topic uh, since I have my courtesy appointment in applied math that I will talk about something that's very applied mathy. Um, So one running theme throughout uh, general methods for graphs uh, are the idea of graph Laplacians or diffusions or, or spectral theory. Um, and this underlies kind of a ton of different methods. Two that I picked out here are, are finding low dimensional embeddings uh, and also for personalized page rank. Um, so they rely on constructing this matrix called the graph Laplacian, which is just equal to the diagonal degree matrix minus the adjacency matrix. And there's different normalization schemes that, that you can have that give that are useful in different contexts. Okay. And so this was another kind of problem where we started off with just what do we think the higher order version of this mathematical object is? Um, that is actually answered by an idea in algebraic topology, which is the idea of, of simplicial complexes and Hodge Laplacians. There's a lot of math here, um, but if so, so let me just not talk too much about that. The idea is that there is a higher order notion of a Laplacian, it's called a Hodge Laplacian. But the problem is that there's no kind of good way of normalizing it to get it to relate to all these diffusions in a nice way or random walks. And we spent a lot of time trying to do this right and the math is very complicated and um, I'd rather just show some pictures. So here's kind of the higher order uh, generalization of, of diffusion maps or low dimensional embeddings. And so we're given this kind of structure here, there's some value on every edge and we end up embedding the edges into two dimensional space. Um, and you can see that there's kind of this localization of these embeddings around these two holes that are in the beta set. This is not a coincidence that I'll talk about soon. If we also looked at kind of the, took some paths in this data set, uh, and we looked at how their projections evolved as we do these paths, we'd end up with these plots on the right. And you can see that kind of the red, orange, and green, which are moving over here, they all move over in this space. These ones going between the three, between the two holes go along another space, and these ones going around the hole over here move up to the top. We did the same thing looking at uh, ocean drifter data around Madagascar. Madagascar is a really nice example of a, of a hole in the ocean, if you think about things flowing in the ocean. And you end up with these similar types of embeddings. And so where, like, why is, why is this happening? At a very high level, these idea of holes are, are a higher order generalization, or they're coming from the idea of homology and algebraic topology. And so, if you're familiar with spectral graph theory, you might know that the first eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian connect um, kind of clusters or, or nearly connected components. And this is related to zeroth order homology, if you want to use the fancy math terms. When we go higher order and we look at the first eigenvectors of the Hodge Laplacian, the 
analog of connected components is holes in the data. And so that's why we're seeing these holes play an important role. We can connect this and, and kind of have interesting versions of page rank algorithms that take into account these holes. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting kind of stuff on the mathy side for doing topology uh, in higher order data analysis, um, but uh, that would take uh, maybe its own talk. So thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to stick around for questions. I'll just say that uh, a lot of the data I talked about today is available on my website. And so if you're interested in working with it, I'd be very happy to help you with that. Uh, and also thanks to the Army NSF and JPMorgan Chase. Thanks.